Number 60, the people of the state of New York versus Brian Henry. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Kristen Connell, and I represent the people of the State of New York. Your Honor, I'd ask for one minute of rebuttal. You may. Ms. Connell, did the yes. defendant have the right to counsel on the criminal possession of stolen property charge? Well, at that point, Your Honor, he hadn't been charged with criminal possession of stolen property. He had only been charged officially with criminal possession of marijuana. That was the charge for which he had been assigned counsel at arraignment. So when he was taken into custody a couple of days later, I think it was, on the possession of stolen property charge, mm. did he have a right to counsel? Well, at that point, Your Honor, um, he was brought in for, it, it's, it's a very complicated set of facts, I will allow. Um, he was pulled over because he had been speeding and he had run a number of stop signs. At that point, um, the officer who pulled him over made a call in. Uh, there had been a discovery that stolen property had been discovered d during the previous arrest. They said, we'd like to speak with him because there has been uh, stolen property discovered. That's what they brought him in on. At that point, the only charge for which that defendant had counsel was the marijuana charge. I understand that. But yes, Judge. Was he in custody on the possession of stolen property at some point that day? Um, he was in custody, yes. At that so point, did, did, did he have a right to counsel on the possession of stolen property charge? He did not invoke his right to counsel on the possession. I didn't ask you that question. Did he have the right to counsel? I, if he had invoked his right to counsel, I believe... Was he, he, was he advised of it? Yes, he was immediately, when, when the interrogation began, he was read his Miranda rights, he signed a Miranda rights card, and he agreed mm -hmm. to speak with detectives. That was never a question at the suppression uh, hearing. No, but he still had the right to counsel. Otherwise, he wouldn't have waived the right to counsel. Of course. Of course, Judge. No. And every defendant has the right to counsel. That's something that we would concede. Well, under he wasn't represented. He wasn't actually wasn't represented. represented, absolutely. And this is not the kind of case, we would argue, that Cohen was meant to address. Cohen was meant to address cases where there has been an attorney who has actually entered a case. In Cohen, um, the, the officer's behavior was described as flagrant and intentional because the Thompson garage case uh, in which the defendant already had uh, counsel, that attorney spoke with the detectives and said, I am representing this, this defendant. You are not to speak with him about this case. I'm going to go back for just a second. Sure. Why, why wasn't he arraigned on the... Um, uh, on the possession of stolen property charges when he was initially in custody. Do we well, know that? I believe that he, was, he wasn't immediately charged, Judge. I, I understand that. We right. So he was brought in, and I believe that they wanted to speak with him. At that point, I don't believe that the detectives knew that they had probable cause necessarily to arrest. They, they wanted. Gone, I thought they hadn't gone through the phone yet, the Blackberry, and they hadn't identified it. Well, at that point, I believe they had looked at the oh, phones. Think... Yes, Judge. They had looked at the phones. No, no, wait, wait, we may be at. When he's first brought in on the marijuana charge, yes. do they know that the Blackberry is stolen from the tattoo parlor? Probably? At that point, they do not. Do they judge. know that it's stolen at all? Um, at that point, they don't. You know, uh, when and he, he denied ownership of it. He denied yeah. ownership, yes. He said, those phones aren't mine. I believe he even said, I think they're broken. Um, you so, know. So here's the problem I have. Sure. The marijuana charge leads to the stolen phone. Mm -hmm. The stolen phone leads to the robbery, and the robbery um, uh, has the same car and same driver, it is the murder, right? Sure, Judge. Oh, however, unless you're not done. No, I'm done. Okay, that's good. Um, if we look at the kind of cases where Cohen has been, if we look at the, if, if I assume your trouble is the first Cohen analysis, the Towns Vela, if you were, analysis, yeah. um, there have been plenty of cases in which um, there have been far more intertwined um, sets of facts than these cases. You know, in this case, there was only the car. One might argue that the instrumentality of the crime was 
the, um, was the glue that holds all of those different cases, the, the three different crimes together. Certainly, it's the only thing that holds the murder and the marijuana charge together. One might argue, indeed, the suppression court did argue that the robbery charge was related. And indeed, the only thing the suppression but, court- But isn't the point of the interrogation to get statements from him to connect the dots and to connect him to these two crimes? Well- And others who participated in it? Y yes, Judge, however, the two detectives wanted to speak with this defendant. And indeed, they did want to talk to him. They did the interrogation together, but they did it in, in chunks, as it were. Over seven hours, yeah? Over seven hours, but one detective- Coming in and out. In and one out. One asking about robbery, one asking about the murder. Exactly. They That's obviously thought he was, if nothing else, involved. Well, they wanted to speak with him about the robbery and they wanted to speak with him about the murder. However, there is absolutely nothing in the suppression record to indicate that they ever asked him about the marijuana charge, which was... No, no, no but I'm asking about the purpose of the interrogation is to connect him to this robbery and to the murder, no? Absolutely, Judge. They wanted information about the robbery and they wanted information about the murder. And indeed, it seems their primary purpose was to find out who, especially because there's no evidence that this defendant ever did anything but drive if he, the car. If he had told the, either or both of them simultaneously, depending on when, mm -hmm. when they're in his presence, uh, you know, I, I got a lawyer on that marijuana count. Should they have done anything at that point? It doesn't say anything else. I have a lawyer on the other, well, I think at that point the detectives might have said, would you like to speak with your lawyer? That's something they could have said. They might have said, would you like so they didn't to have be... to stop they wouldn't have had to stop it because it wasn't related to the crimes about which they were asking it the marijuana it, you know the suppression court there's nothing we can do at this point you know this case talked about uh, this court in concepcion and, and statutorily there's nothing we can do about the suppression of the robbery statements but it's important i think to look at the, de the decision mm -hmm. that the suppression court made because it resulted in a windfall that begat the second windfall in the appellate division. Well, let me ask you this. If the relevant comparison, and, and I, I, I don't necessarily think it is, uh, for, for purposes of the suppression court, or the Cohen test, is between the robbery and the murder charges, mm -hmm. okay, is that test met? We would argue that it's still not met. Well, how do you say that when you, in response to the severance motion, are arguing that they're completely related and intertwined? Well, that was, um, that was a huge problem the appellate division had um, with our argument. However, there are two entirely different tests, Your Honor. Um, one analysis is done by two detectives who don't have a full set of facts in front of them. In fact, you know, if you look at um, People's Appendix, at I believe it's page 128, Detective Ross testified at the hearing that he didn't even know if he had enough probable cause to arrest yet when he was talking to the defendant that day. He knew where he lived, but he wasn't going out to arrest the guy yet. At that point, Cohen asks the defendant, the detectives, are trying to figure out if if two cases are so woven together that you know that just, talking to a defendant about one is going to incriminate a defendant on the other. I just want to back you up for a second. So if he actually had retained counsel on the robbery at the time he was brought in, mm -hmm. your position is they could never nevertheless that doesn't satisfy Cohen that they can interrogate him about the murder. We would argue that that argument can be made. Yes, Judge. And you're making it. Well, I'll make it. <laughs> if you're asking me to, I'll make it. No, I'm, our, I'm asking our, what you think. I'm asking if you think that's a tenable position. I think that I think it can be a tenable position because I think that the two crimes were separate enough that in inquiring about one would not have necessarily incriminated defendant on the other. The robbery and spatially and temporally separate. Yes, the only thing that really drew the two crimes together enough, which is why the joinder analysis is is a different analysis. The joinder analysis requires. Um, it asks whether evidence needs to be put together for a story to make sense in front well, of a jury. It's much more liberal, uh, perhaps, uh, a standard. It's, sure. And Cohen is a well, much... What's, what's the connection? What's the connection, the connection is the car. Right. He's a getaway driver. Sure, but the instrument... They, that's not enough. Well, in Grant, it wasn't necessarily enough. 
Judge well, Tatone. Let me answer this question. I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Sure. So if the defendant is riding in a car and he has three discrete bags of proceeds from a burglary in the car. Okay. The police tie up one bag of proceeds to a specific burglary. They arrest him. Mm. He gets arraigned. He gets assigned counsel. He makes bail. He's released. Two weeks later, the police connect the proceeds from bags two and three to separate burglaries. They bring him in. Can they question him on those two burglaries? That's so. Uh, that's hard to say, Judge. I mean, I think it's similar. I think that that I I think that at the end of the day, that analysis is closer to the question of whether or not the robbery and the murder here were interwoven. Um, I think that what you're asking is a close call, Judge. But what we are asking this court to find. A close call that, that as to whether or not he has count, right? Yes. However, what we are asking this court to find and where we truly believe the appellate division erred was, was entering into that analysis at all because he did not have actual representation on the robbery. He only had it on the marijuana charges. And by extending the right to counsel because by Because he proxy, had not yet been charged on the robbery? He hadn't yet been charged he, on the robbery. He, even though there had been an inventory search of the vehicle? Well, there had been- they suspected that he was indeed involved in these crimes? There had been a search of the vehicle because the two occupants of the vehicle were both arrested and the car was taken no, in. No, I know why it's inventoried, sure. of sure. course. Yeah, sure, Judge. I mean, but that, that is what had happened, but um, he, he still didn't have an attorney on, on the case. So the analysis that the appellate division should have done and the way that it should have gone under well, Cohen- that's because you've delayed, right? You delayed the arraignment? Or you delayed the charge Did on the robbery? I mean, because you're, they're doing this interrogation, right? Well, Detective Ross testified at the suppression hearing that he wasn't yet ready to arrest defendant on the robbery. He said this entire, you know, the, the investigation, I believe is page 135, he said, we just weren't there yet. He knew, he said, I knew but where the defendant- they did bring him in on the possession of stolen property when they radioed in. Well, they, they, right? at that point, Judge, they, they, they had him. They him to bring him in and on the stolen property charge, Yes, correct? Judge. I, at that point, they, he had already been pulled over. They said, all right, you know, if you've got him pulled over, all right, bring him in, we'll talk to him. I think at that point, the other detective, Detective Bakritsky, might have also wanted to speak with him. It was no longer just Detective Ross's they If when they brought him in, Yes. He said, I have nothing to say, and started to walk out. Could they keep him? Well, I think at that point they would have kept him. They on what? Him. On what? I'm sorry. Kept him on what? On criminal on possession robbery? of stolen property at that because point. At the, because when he gets up and says, I don't have anything to say, I'm leaving, now they have probable cause? Well, I think they had probable cause on the criminal possession of stolen property, not necessarily on the robbery yet at that point, Judge. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Judge. Counsel? Yes, good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, Judah Maltz, Mr. Brian Henry, how are you? This, the Cohen case, I mean, Brian Henry case is consistent with the litany of cases decided by this court in the past five decades. Counsel, why isn't, were this, with why each isn't other. this like rough, okay, where, um, where the uh, defendant uh, was entitled to counsel? but had, had, was not yet represented. Why isn't the representation here on the robbery a legal fiction? Well, first of all, um, the late Judge uh, Hanoff, when he rendered the decision saying his right to counsel attached, indelible right to counsel attached, uh, that decision had to be upheld on the 470.15 of the criminal procedure law. The people never challenged that in the court below to see whether or not La Fontaine and Concepcion should be overruled or modified. It is a decision favorable to the defendant. It's not answering your no, question No, 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 I understand that, that we, we're not discussing whether, the, whether the, uh, the questioning on the robbery should have been, or the statements on the robbery should have been suppressed. Right. But my point is, is that in terms of an, then analyzing what they could question about as far as the murder was concerned, he wasn't actually represented on the robbery, right? He wasn't, but he wasn't. But when, the, when they found out that the stolen property was related to a robbery, and they found out that almost the next day they pounded this car. How many people get 
Um, how many people get arrested for marijuana and have their vehicle impounded by the police? That's the county police. They knew that his vehicle was used in connection to a crime, and it was not only to the second stop of the vehicle that they realized that the, stolen fo the phone was stolen, and it was connected to the tattoo robbery. But let's We're take this a step further than from Judge Stein. So now you have this fact scenario, but let's say in the murder, he takes that gun after the murder and he sells it to somebody. Assume that's a violation of state law. So that's another crime they're looking at. And that crime's related to the murder through the gun and the murder's related to the robbery through the car and the robbery's related to the marijuana stop through the phone. Do you not, are you not able to ask about the gun sale? I mean, how many degrees of separation do you have to have? I anticipated that question very well. Hmm. I anticipated that someone's gonna ask me that question, how far do we get? I don't think they would go on ad infinitum to question him for many more hours because they realized under Raymond's case, the right to arraignment, prompt arraignment within a reasonable delay, within a reasonable no, period of time. It's not a timing they issue. I mean, kept them. When do you say, as Judge Stein was saying, he's not represented on the robbery, right. he's not represented on the murder, and now he's not represented on this hypothetical no gun sale, infinite. but we're all tying that back to representation on a marijuana stuff. If you, being another detective, to question him about that gun sale, and it's related to, came forward from, from the robbery and came forward because of the, the stolen property, he is right the counsel would be safeguarded, would have to be, because they, they would have to take a moment of their time and not inter, in, uh, interrogate him immediately. What we had was Brzezinski and Ross taking turns. turns. Ross was connected to the homicide squad. He was a homicide detective. He testified in the suppression hearing on page 8, A92. He was with the Nassau County uh, so, homicide. So, so what should have happened? Is, is your position that under the law, what should have happened is that the police officers should have reached out to the attorney on the marijuana count? Correct. They could have done that. They could have reached out to the district attorney's office and say, we have a gentleman who's being investigator for a robbery homicide. Uh, so what should what we happens, do with the marijuana? Reach, uh, well, should we on. dismiss it? They, they reach out to that attorney and he says, you know what? Uh, I'm just uh, qualified to do misdemeanors, uh, uh, marijuana case. charges and things. Uh, I, I, I don't know anything about robberies and Your burglaries. Honor, that's the McLean case. When the lawyer said, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not involved with that case. But what about the Johnson case when the defendant was involved in a negotiation for a lenient sentence on a burglary case and he tells them and he gives his client to the district attorney to talk to them about an entry into a cooperation agreement. And then they're going to question him about a homicide, which he had information on. Then it turns out that he's the one who's uh, implicated in that homicide. And this court said, 2014, that his right to counsel attached because his client was engaged in a lien state. The client, the attorney client relationship still existed. McLean case, what you're referring to, is when the lawyer said, I only represent him in this case, and I don't represent him on any other cases. Johnson, this court followed up with Johnson, said the representative continued. To answer your honor, Garcia, Judge Garcia's case, um, I think if another case was brought up to him, like a rape charge or something just as serious, the police officers would be foolish to continue to question him on the unrelated charge of a rape, knowing full well he's already spent seven hours being examined on a robbery <coughs> and, and a homicide, and they should say, let's stop, let's pause. He's been in custody seven hours. This all happened within three hours. I would think the amount of time is important, but I don't think, I think it's the relationship. Even if another crime will come up, I think they would be foolish not to investigate further from the district attorneys of whether they could the, investigate. The, the logical extension of, of what you're saying then, that uh, once you give him uh, counsel on this misdemeanor or violation, depending on the amount uh, of, of marijuana and whether it's open or not, um, uh, aren't you saying then then that's it. Uh, that's you you can never uh, separate uh, any of these other investigations and, and we had and that question them. I pardon me. We had that rule before we got we overruled it in Bing. That used to be Bing. the rule. Right. So right. You're saying, right. Judge Feinman, saying like you want us to go back to pre-Bing. But what about Judge Lo, uh, Your Honor? What about Lopez case and the Bordeaux case, where when you mentioned about him being in custody? In those cases, Lopez, when they knew he had counsel, and when they went to Pennsylvania. They went to Pennsylvania to investigate him on an unsolved homicide case. They could have investigated further and contacted the district attorneys to find out the status of that case. He had an attorney present in Lopez. And yet this court seemed to take a back stand against us. While you eliminated derivative right to counsel, you said 
that they should have inquired to see whether or not he had counsel in Lopez. And that was, Lopez is a very recent case, and recent pronouncement saying that they should have inquired. They should have, as you mentioned, a, this course had presumption of knowledge that he was represented by counsel. But, but, but we already, that, that's not the issue here, because we already, they already knew he, right. he was represented on the marijuana right. charge. And we all know that he wasn't represented on the, on the uh, robbery charge. Your Honor, it is closely connected to the crimes. If you have another detective to answer your questions, if I think if there was another crime being charged against him, that, and was, he made statements, those statements would have to be suppressed because there's no pronounced break in the interrogation. It was continuous. The police, would, if they were to spend time and relax their energies to question him and notify the DA's office to see whether we could continue examining him, they could have charged him, processed the arrest for rape, for the robbery and the homicide, and maybe put him in police lineups for the rape charges, but to question him continuously, I, I don't think they have the right to do that. What they, what they could have done in my, my client's case, they could, when they, he was arrested for the marijuana, they could have notified the district attorney, they would have said, give him an ACD. Don't, don't interrogate him. He was stopped by the police on December uh, 13th. Then when he, got, when he found a cell phone, okay? They were investigating that cell phone because when he said only one, one phone he doesn't, be, doesn't belong to him, the other three belong to him, the other one belongs to the co-defendant. They immediately knew that that phone was the serial number. They got off of it. It was a stolen phone from the tattoo robbery. No, I, I had thought the sequence was a little different. I thought the 13th was when the robbery took place, the 15th. That's right, sorry. Yeah, the 13th the shooting, and the 15th. And then the marijuana was on the 20th. I That's thought correct. It was the opposite and, sequence. Correct. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's no problem. And yeah. they could have inquired and known for well that he may be the person involved in this getaway crime of the two robberies, robbery and the homicide, they could have notified the district attorney and said, let's put us, we want to talk to him. They could have then dismissed the ACD. With no, with no open cases against him, then you have the McLean situation. All, all, Mr. Of, those, could say that all, all of things that you're me? saying certainly could be possible. The real question is whether or not they're legally mandated and does not matter here, right? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, the only question is whether or not that is legally mandated and does it matter here. So I understand your position. You're saying this is what they could have done. The question right. is, they did, they, did they, by law, did they have to do those things? They don't. Of course not. They don't do that all the time. Uh, what I'd like to point out is that detectives worked in tandem. They, Ross, you talked that Ross was with the homicide squad, and he was also with the murder investigation. Bresnovsky said, I'll speak to him for a number of hours, got the information he needed, when, then Ross took over. And Bresnovsky, whether he stepped away or not, he came back into the room, and Ross remained there. So they were working to solve these two crimes. They were related, interrelated with each other, and there's, no, there's nothing, and, and as the lower court noted, there was no uh, separation between two crimes, and it was necessary to prove the identity of him on both crimes by inter interrogating him on these crimes. And I'd also like to point out, they, under Cohen statute, uh, standard part two, they um, engaged in per impermissible examination of him. They exploited him being there and uh, right to counsel attached. I, so, so, so to be clear, you want us to analyze this under the second test of Cohen? Well, they were related and mutually with each other. There's no distinction between the two crimes. There was a getaway car. They, they had a witness who saw the vehicle being used, the type of vehicle was. They told him that there was a witness who saw him with the uh, driving away from the vehicle, from the location, and then they, and they asked him, who committed this robbery, this homicide? After he got that information, who committed this robbery? You, we know you're a getaway driver on this. Who committed? Are the same people who committed the homicide? And he gave that information. That they were connected. <laughs> I'm just to throw Sorry, one you at you. Is that, is that question, if, if we get to that question and we say that there is we judge this by the, the, the robbery and, and the murder. The, the, the question of whether um, it was uh, uh, discreet or fairly separable and, and whether the, and, and a question I think of what the appellate division never got to, which is whether it was purposely exploitive, but whatever. It, is, is that not um, a, question, a mixed question? I believe so. I believe when I, Your Honor, when I spoke to you on the telephone, I thought I discussed that. I thought this was a mixed question of law and fact, and I thought this case was not, should not have been. Well, that's separate from, yeah. the, I think, the legal question right. of whether we should be comparing question. the robbery to the murder. That, that I think it is a mixed question of law and fact, which uh, I believe that 
the court appeal, the decision by the appellate division was properly decided based upon the long authority by this court. The, the case of Vela, Irmo, and um, Grant, and Call, and Stewart, all, and, and, Bur and Burdell and Lopez is consistent with the decision of Henry. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Counsel? Do both tests, do in our analysis, do we apply both tests of Cohen, as counsel suggested? <laughs> the factually intertwined and the purposely exploitive? Should this court apply both tests? Well, to, to which counts, Judge? So the, the marijuana, the criminal possession of stolen property, and the robbery is being factually intertwined, and then the purposefully exploitive test to the robbery slash murder. The, the interrogation as it was here, Judge, was on the, so the defendant was arrested for the charge for which he had counsel was only on the marijuana. The interrogation was not on criminal possession of stolen property itself. It was on the robbery and the murder. So what we would ask this court to do as a purely issue of law. Is that dispositive as, that there were no questions on the, the, the possession of stolen property? Um, the, it might have come up. I believe the, the real crux of the interrogation itself um, you, you're correct, Judge. There may have been some question about that. The record is not entirely clear, um, so it's not fair to say what they talked about for however long it was. As we've discussed, it was a very long interrogation. Um, but what the detectives were truly trying to get to, the heart of the matter, was who were the two men who were in the car with defendant because, if, as we've established, he was just driving the car. Um, what we are asking this court to do is to truly decide which is more appropriate, to apply Cohen to the marijuana charge and the murder charge, or to apply it to, as defendant is asking and as the appellate division did, to the robbery and the murder charge together. It's our position that whichever way it's applied, either way, um, Cohen would not be violated. Um, but we, it's our argument that it should be applied to the way the hearing court did to the murder and to the marijuana charge because the, the marijuana charge was the only charge for which defendant had an attorney. And that is that was the crux of Cohen. Those are the kinds of cases with actual representation for which Cohen was meant to apply. Um, the one reason I, I got up, and this is just very, very small factual matter, um, in Nassau County, unlike in most of the counties in New York City, I just wanted to make clear, it's very unusual for um, ACDs, or as we call them, ACO ODs on marijuana possession to be handed out at arraignment. So I just wanted to kind of get that across. That's not something that would have been typical. So whether or not that is relevant at all, it's just not something that's usually done. Thank you, counsel. Thanks, judges.